Hi again everyone and welcome back to another video lecture and this time I'll be discussing lesson 6 of our discussions for 21st century literature from the Philippines and the world. The title of this lesson is An Introduction to the Literary Contributions of Central Luzon. So we're going to be focusing on the Kapampangan speaking region of Luzon. Okay, now as a warm up or like a pre activity or a pre lecture activity for everyone, I want you to quickly uh, ponder on this question. Okay, how do you think your environment affects you? How? Does it affect your mood? You know, th does it affect your quality of life? Uh, does it affect how you perceive things and how you view life, uh, the bigger picture of life in general? Uh, does, it, does it affect certain behaviors that you eventually develop as you grow and mature in that and progress in that environment? Does it... Um, give you certain principles or or you know um uh, leanings uh towards things that you see as more valuable because this is something you're so accustomed to or so used to you know the thing is obviously our environment affects us in varying degrees in different levels you know, there's so many ways that it could affect us and and hone us and mold us and transform us and um, basically make us who we are as we get older, as we mature, as we figure out life, as we figure out who ourselves are. Okay? Now, in storytelling, uh, environment plays a key role you know, in influencing what the story is going to be like, how it's going to feel like, and what new is it going to offer to the senses of our audience. You know? And I'm going to show you several award-winning films that have made use of their environment, uh, the authenticity, you know, the organicness of their environment to tell the story in the most raw kind of possible way. Okay? So I'll let you through uh, some of these award-winning films and some of these are actually my all-time favorite. Okay? The first one is a short film by Peterson Vargas. He's a native of, Kapam of Pampanga. So he is a Pampangan director and he graduated in the University of the Philippines um, film uh, in, uh, with a with a major or with a degree in film and Lishun Kong Geographia was actually his entry at the Cinema Life Film Festival for short film competition and it actually won. I think it won um best um original screenplay and best picture for the short films uh category. So, Lishun Kong Geographia was inspired by the director's first love in high school. Yeah, it's a story about two boys and one of them falling in love with uh, what he initially sees as his best friend. So, it's sort of like uh, a, 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 a melancholic uh, telling of that great love that he had when he was in high school. So, it was about Pip and uh, I forgot the name of the guy here, but yeah, I remember watching it at the Cinema Life Film Festival a couple of years back at the CCP Complex in Manila. And I couldn't, you know, it's one of those films that give you that afterglow, like right when you stepped out of the cinema, it lingers on to you and it stays on to you. In a, in a depressive kind of um, way. Because <laughs> I remember feeling very sad for, of course, one of the boys here. Because the love that he has for another person cannot be and will not be reciprocated. Okay, so it's just a one-way uh, one 
uh, street for him as far as love goes. So again, uh, the setting of this uh, movie was set or uh, the, the setting or the, the place where the story took happened uh, was in Pampanga. That's why there are a lot of scenes here that were taken in the Lahar areas of Pampanga and that Lahar was um, the aftermath you know, of uh, the Mount Pinatubo eruption in 1991. So once again, this is Lishun Kong Geografia by Peterson Vargas, by director uh, Peterson Vargas. Okay, another favorite story of mine, I don't know if some of you are familiar with this, but probably you're familiar with the girl here. Uh, her name is Sorsha Ronin. And she appeared in several big films already. And this is one of those, uh, Lady Bird. And she also appeared in uh, Little Women with the same director, uh, Greta Gerwig. And I think in a music video by Ed Sheeran, she was there too. Um, I forgot the title, but it's about a girl. That's the, 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 the title has something to do with, uh, you know, being about a girl or something. I, I forgot. Yeah. So this film is Lady Bird, uh, Greta Gerwig. Again, uh, the, the the director here was inspired by her hometown in Sacramento, uh, California. And yeah, the, the story was set in Sacramento and everything that she's familiar with, everything that, everything that sort of um, made her who she is today because it was such a huge part of her coming of age and, and transition from being a young girl to a young adult is, you know, uh, is, is well felt in the mood, in the atmosphere, in the feel of the storytelling of the film. So again, environment uh, really plays an influential role on how a story is told or how writers think of their stories. Some of the greatest or the best writers or my favorite writers actually make use of their hometowns as an inspiration to their storytelling. And most of their first works are all about that. And this includes, of course, uh, Peterson Vargas and this time uh, Greta Gerwig, the director of Lady Bird. Now, another movie, um, this is a controversial one, and I think some of you might have seen this film because it's kind of, this kind of gained a following, a decent cult following, if I may say. This is Call Me By Your Name, and um, it was an adapted, uh, a book adaptation, and was turned into a screenplay in 2017 by director by the Italian director Luca Guadagnino. No, he he immediately this story, given that it was directed by an uh, it was authored or written by an Italian writer, this immediately gravitated towards um, uh, Luca Guadagnino because of course he's Italian and he grew up most of his uh, young life was spent. Um, being nurtured by his hometown in Italy, specifically in Crema, Italy. And he made use of several locations of Crema to be the settings for the storytelling of the film, Call Me By Your Name. And it's amazing, but I also want to give a foreword for everyone that this is a gay love story. And it's not for everyone. <laughs> I don't think it's for everyone. But this is an eye opener on how similar um homosexual love is to of course to heteronormative to our idea of to our standard of what a typical heteronormative um love is you know, it's just as this, it's just as this i mean how do I say it it's just basically the same it's just as pure. It's just as um, serious. It's just as passionate. It's just as committed. It's just as as real as it gets. So again, uh, the, the telling of the story was inspired by the director's hometown in Crema, Italy. Beautifully, beautifully shot film. I love 
the cinematography of the film from the beginning towards the end. And of course, it was starred by uh, Timothy Chalamet, which is an upcoming uh, Hollywood actor these days. Okay. okay, I think this will be the last. Uh, this is Roma by Alfonso Cuaron. If you're not familiar with Alfonso Cuaron, he actually directed the third film of Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. So um, Warner Brothers actually tapped on director Alfonso Cuaron to direct uh, the third installment of Harry, po- of Harry Potter. And, it, it, you know, if you're a Potterhead or if you happen to be a fan, a hardcore fan of Harry Potter, you would tell that the storytelling and the, the dark, the richness and also the darkness of how the cinematography was done with, um, and the, sor- the storytelling as well was done in in the third installment of the Harry Potter franchise, you would know that it, it a different director actually did it. So it, it was not Christopher, I, I, Chris, Chris, I forgot the last name of the first director or the, is not just the first director, but I think he also directed uh, three other films. But anyway, Alfonso Cuaron only directed one Harry Potter film and you can tell immediately just by the feel of the film that a different person directed it you know, because he has such a different take or approach on his directorial of or adaptation of the third book of uh, J.K. Rowling's um, Harry Potter. Okay. So again, um, Roma is actually a real-life inspirational, uh, not inspirational, but it's inspired by the real events of Alfonso Cuaron and his family growing up in a quiet neighborhood in Roma, Mexico, in Colonia Roma, uh, Mexico. And um, one of the most um, poignant um, memory of his childhood here was his experiences and encounters with their domestic helper, uh, I forgot her name. Yeah, I forgot her name, but she was sort of like the star of the film, and it was her first time to actually act in a big film uh, directed by a huge director. And yeah, so it was really just about the childhood of uh, Alfonso Cuaron. So that's him right there, the, the child being fed, and that's uh, his ever-dependable nanny, or um, domestic helper. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So again, uh, environments with with which writers live in or spend a lot of time, if of their lives, affect the way they write their pieces, and most often than not, these will become a primary source of inspiration in so many ways, so many layers and so many dimensions to what their pieces are going to be like as they craft their stories. Yeah. So, um, and I think you know, if some of you will try to become writers or are aspiring to become writers, I think that you can relate to them because, um, you know, uh, many of you would take inspirations from your current experiences and those current experiences that we're having or we have at the moment are actually inspired by where we are, the location of where we live, uh, our environment. And this is also true to me as a songwriter because I, uh, I used to write a lot of songs when I was in high school all the way up to college. And a lot of my songs were actually... um things that happened to me in my hometown in Santa Ana, Manila, you know, the, the pain, the fun moments, uh, the first love, um, the struggles, you know, um, the, my identity crisis, um, the, the, the things I love about the place I grew up in, you know, those were common themes or common messages or significant messages I wanted to bring along in my songwriting. 
Okay, so it's as the same. It's just the same as, uh, of course, writers of stories because songwriting is also is also a form of storytelling. Okay, all right. So, it, our environment again is where most of us learn to the places where we live in the pr- the places where we were born. The places where we grew up in, you know, it's the place where we learn to dream. No, ito yung mga, ito, 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 the, the place where we are right now, Montalban or Kasiglaan, ito yung lugar kung saan tayo unang mga ngarap, no, ng maganda para sa buhay natin. No? So, um, and it's also uh, the place where we get to experience different memories, memorable moments in our lives, whether it's sad or somewhere in between, or whether it's among those happiest memories we've ever had in our life, no? So, and these are things that we're gonna recall or reminisce or we look back to um, as as source of inspiration for what we're gonna be writing about, specifically for writers or for aspiring writers. So, in fact, most writers would make use of their home places as their inspiration or even as actual settings of their literary pieces as proven, as shown from the example films and screen films and screenplays that I've shown you a while ago. In some cases, like the effects of the eruption of Mount Pinatubo to the people of central Luzon, can go well beyond the immediate and the physical. It has also affected people's minds and sensibilities as well. You know, for instance, I always talk about the negativities or the negative things about living here in Montalban because undeniably there are so many things that we need to fix, you know? But at the same time, if it weren't for, I mean, I may sound like puro na lang ako negative, or in fact, I take credit for the negative things I could observe observe around me because if I couldn't see them, I wouldn't know what needs to be fixed. So somehow it affected my 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 thinking and my sensibilities, no? Kasi alam mong may mali, alam mong may pangit, alam mong may hindi tama, alam mong may kailang umayos. And you're not just describing the negative for negativity's sake, no. You're actually calling it out because you want that to be changed. You want people to realize that we need to act on it and we need to do something for that to be changed. Okay? So yun yung, yun yung sinasabi natin here na it affects how people think and the sensibilities of our minds, our mindsets as well. Okay. Now, in the case of Mount Pinatubo, no, huge effects... Um, huge events rather that really impacted the lives of millions of people we're not just talking about hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands here but millions of people in the philippines you know? this put drastic changes to the lives of people and in doing so the context of these people were changed as well so context okay let's define context basically in a nutshell, or if I'm going to simplify context, no, it's anything that's local to a certain group of people or to a certain place. I hope na gets nyo siya, no? It's anything na nag exist lamang doon sa isang lugar or within a group of similar people. For example, the Filipino context, no? Ano bang pwede natin masabi na mga phenomenon or mga kaganapan na nag exist lang at tay-tay lang mga Filipino ang nakaka-relate? For example, the problem or the plight of OFWs and the families they leave behind. And the Americans won't be able to get that context as much as we do and as much as we understand it because they don't really you know, uh, send people abroad to work as OAWs or Overseas American Workers, no? What they have are expats or expatriates. And expats are different because most of the time, expats are being sent to another country to work as professionals, as high-level people. And in our case, no, we send people as domestic helpers, 
as construction workers, as blue colored workers, as nurses. So that's sort of uh, different with expatriates, no? Ano pang context, ano pang Filipino context ang ang, ang posibleng hindi magagets ng ibang tao? Ah, another, I noticed this, no? Yung sachet economy. Although this is something that also exists in other Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and of course the Philippines. But yung sachet economy where everything is in a sachet, everything we buy, toyo, mantika, uh, ketchup, um, uh, skincare products, hair care products like shampoo, conditioner, uh, soap, and almost everything can be bought in a single-use plastic called sachet. No? At malala ito kasi, I mean, it's cheap, it's affordable, it's probably what most of us can only afford, but at the same time, it also creates um, a per- sort of like a permanent problem, no? a, long t- a long-term a uh, serious problem to our environment. No? So sa ibang bansa, hindi uso yung sachet economy. Walang ganun. Kumbaga, hindi ka basta basta makakabili ng per sachet there. Kung meron man in very few selected stores, but most people buy in containers, they buy in bottles. So yung mga kwento at or yung mga problema ang nakikreate ng sachet economy is not something people from developed countries like Japan or the US will be able to understand. Okay? So, I hope na intindihan natin kung ano yung context, no? Pag sinabing context, ito yung something na meron tayong sense of locality na nakaka-relate tayo because it exists um within the same group of people. It happens or it exists in a specific place where a specific group of people can only experience or can relate to more than anyone else. Okay? Kaya di ba kapag may, ano, kapag may nagde-trend na topic, let's say sa Twitter or sa Facebook, lagi tayo nagtatanong kapag hindi natin nag-gets ko yung pinag-usapan, anong context? So, what's going on? Anong nangyari? So, ano yung anong nangyari na yon? May intindihan nyo lang yun. Kung kilala nyo yung taong involved, no? Kasi, kung hindi, there's no context for you. Okay? So context is the collection. So let's define context in a in a sort of technical kind of definition, okay? Context is a collection of interrelated conditions in which something exists or occurs, no? Interrelated conditions na mga pangyayari, mga kaganapan, okay? Context therefore is what is around us, no? Which influences us as much as we influence it. So it's a two-way thing, no? Uh, context is something that influences us, but we also influence it. Kasi nga, we're part of it. No, we are part of what context is. Kasi nga, tayo yung ando dun eh. Tayo yung nakaka-experience. Tayo yung nasusurround ng mga kaganapan. Writers have used context to create various forms of written work such as poetry, fiction, drama, and essays. So, yung paggamit, yung, yung, yung paggamit ng mga writers or ng directors or ng authors ng kanilang hometown as their source of inspiration to tell their stories, that's context itself. Kasi, you can't really understand everything about the storytelling, no? Kasi, if you're not from there, if you don't understand certain um, norms or customs or way of life there no lalo na, let's say for example sa Roma Italy you know you won't be able to understand why the place feels that way because you you're not aware of that context you're unf- you're unfamiliar with that context the same can be said for example to the setting of Sacramento California i mean nobody from us has ever lived in the US much less Sacramento California so we won't be able to understand the context of how people live there or what's the way of life like for people living there. Okay? So, yeah. So, again, ha, yung paggamit ng environment as your setting or as an inspiration, uh, as, as a jump start for what your story is gonna be like, that's context as well. Okay? 
So, let's talk about context in the Philippine regions, okay? So, basically, where we are born and where we grow up form a part of our context. No? So, parang context is local na kamalayan. Eh. It's a local... Um, it's the lo- it's our local consciousness of things around us no it's our local familiarity of things that happen around us around us or things that exist around us no? in the case of most filipinos their regions determine most of their context no? i remember someone came up to me and said na ang mga magulang ni daw taga Visayas and Mindanao so she doesn't know anyone who to interview na may experience nung uh, Mount Pinatubo eruption, uh, first and foremost, part of your task is to find someone. No? Bahagi nung kailangan yung gawin ay talagang humanap. And that's a context, uh, that's, that's a contextual um, dilemma or problem for her. Kasi nga, they were from Visayas, Mindanao, so definitely they were far from the area where Mount Pinatubo uh, is, you know. And Siyempre, the farther you go from that place where an event happened, the more unfamiliar that place is to you. Kaya naintindihan ko naman siya na hindi niya agad mag, mat, mag, matap yung taong nakapaligid sa kanya because they have no context, no proper or experiential, experiential or lived context of the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. But however, again, it's part of your task to find someone So, depende sa region mo, depende sa pinanggalingan mo, um, that's the kind of context you'll be able to relate to. So, someone who grew up and and lived most of her life in Zamboanga w- and would go to Manila for the first time would be alienated with Manila and wouldn't really understand the context of what Manila is like or what Manila is. Um, I mean, meron tayong... Um, parang foreign or outsider context of what Manila is based on what we read or what we see on the news or on television. Pero iba talaga yung context kapag ando dun ka na. No? When you're living the actual place. Okay? Context in literary essay. Let's talk about this. So, in this lesson, we'll tackle the essay, you know, essay writing, as a way of seeing and understanding how context Particularly, as a regional writer becomes art, or in this case, how memory becomes an essay. So the context in the the way context was used in the essay actually was very complex. It was used in a very dynamic, in a very complex, in a very very versatile manner. Kasi ang daming context. Eh. Una yung pagputok ng Mount Pina, ng Mount uh, Pinatubo, which is something that not everybody would have a proper context with. Tapos yung pag-alaala sa mga yun, which is also memory. Recalling a memory is also a context because not everyone would have this, not everyone shares the same memory. So not everyone would have the same recall of certain similar memories of the past. So, yeah. Okay. Now, I want to define a literary essay first to everyone para meron tayong refresher. So, We know and understand what an essay is already, right? It's simply a short piece of writing on a particular subject. So it may be brief in its nature. However, it can be very pragmatic, you know, or it can be very expressive. Pag sinabing pragmatic, medyo um, opinionated siya. You want it to deliver a direct message. You know, and s- most of the time, the message is persuasive, confrontational, and it's pragmatic. So you back it up with um, evidence. You back it up with s- uh, sound reasoning and sound logic. Uh, you back it up with proof. You back it up with data, with statistics. You know, uh, whatever your argument is, you back it up with those. Because it, it's pragmatic. It could go very pragmatic. And then it can also be expressive, very literary. No, so, ito yun, yung literary essay, yung very expressive. You make use of a lot of figures of speech. Uh, you make use of, you creatively make use of uh, literary devices to make your uh, discussion a lot more interesting, a lot more flavorful, a lot more, um, a lot more 
inviting for readers, enticing for readers, a lot more entertaining for readers, okay? If done in a manner that tries to elevate its form beyond just being a short piece of writing, then the essay becomes literary. Kaya yung mga expressive essays, mostly they fall under the category literary essay kasi it's something that is related to literature and may now be considered as a written work that is very good and to have lasting importance. Kasi anyway, um, hindi basta-basta ka nag-argue, uh, hindi basta-basta ka nag-express ng whatever message you want to express there, but you make use of the technicalities of liter- of literary writing. You make use of figures of speech, again, uh, literary devices, to, you know, um, make your, as I've said uh, moments ago, make your piece uh, a lot more entertaining, a lot more inviting. Make it have soul. Make it be memorable. Make it have a good, lasting uh, impression to your audience, to your readers. So that's what literary essay. So basically, um, iba siya from a simple essay because it's something that's a lot more elevated in terms of style, in terms of tone, in terms of uh, your, your use of, you know, the cre- creative literary devices that are available out there. Okay? So medyo next level essay of writing, ang literary essay. So, yun ha. So, yung um, Home of the Ash Fall by John Jack Wigley is a, is a form, is an example of a literary essay that's a represent, that is our representative 21st century text, 21st century literary text from Central Luzon. Okay? So, again, um, um, from the way he wrote the literary essay Home of the Ash Fall, he gave us a very clear message that he knows where he comes from. No, ang klaro ng mensahe niya kung taga saan siya at sino siya. No, at anong klaseng Pilipino siya. Okay. Okay. Should I read it? Mm, okay, I'm just going to re- read it for the sake of reading it. However, these regional pieces must also contend with a more dominant Manila-centered national culture, finding room to be accepted by Manila while also preserving the uniqueness of their own origins becomes a challenge every non-Manila writer faces. Kaya nga, most of their works are being translated to Tagalog or Filipino to make it be more appreciated by a wider range of audience. Kasi, tama din naman. It's, It's not just about being manila centered although there's a lot of truth to that pero tama din naman kasi kung tagalog ka tapos yung isang piyesa ay nakasulat sa ibang lingwahe or sa ibang wika how would you be able to understand or appreciate that no kaya siguro that's one factor for why a lot of academics are saying na manila centered ng literature natin is because everything gets translated in tagalog or in a medium where most of us will be able to understand and read it okay kasi of course, uh, Tagalog is one of the bases of our uh, uh, lingua franca, which is the Filipino language. Okay. So yun, uh, it's it's a challenge for them, and what I like about Home of the Ashfall is that it was written in in English, no. So wala siyang favoritism in terms of a local language, and he made use. No, he punched through several um lines in Kapampangan there. Ibang cute and uh, it it's not just for the sake of representing the Kapampangan language. That's why he used some of those lines there. Eh? No, it's not it. But I think it added an element of character of who Kapampangans are. That despite you know um the struggles that they've had, uh you know after the eruption happened, that they can still smile, and they can still persist. You know they can still show a great deal of resilience after that tragic uh, chaos, which is the Mount Pinatubo eruption. Okay? So I think yung insertions ng Kapampangan lines there give us that na ang characters ng mga Filipinos, specifically the Kapampangans, are, we're steadfast. We're, we're like bamboo. We, we bend, but we never break. Sort of spirit kind of 
uh, persona for people, I think. Okay? Okay. So, the effect of these influences on the literature was that, on one hand, there were plenty of Spanish works translated into Pampango. But, on the other hand, of course, um, there's also a continuing oral tradition, one which was critical of the elite Pampanga. So, parang nagkatalo-talo sila here, ano, ng, uh, how, how do we go about with making our local literature rich or richer? How do we preserve? How do we go about in the preservation of it? How do we go about in the nurturing of it? No, so meron pa rin conflict of cla- or clash of of um a mindset and principles when it comes to you know how do we do it and what should be done okay so these two tra- uh, these two traditions existed and commingled creating a literary landscape that used the influences as influences of Spain and America as well as the traditional Pampango. So eventually they have to come into terms with um how do we what's our compromise? No? So definitely Spanish and American influences will forever stay with us, you know. And for them, uh the way to preserve and um encourage local literature is to sort of create this space where everybody can coexist and everybody can be nurtured at the same time. So, yun yung pagkapalaganap nila ng literature nila. Not just using Pampango, but using English, Spanish, if they can, if some people are still capable of, although kumukonti na talaga yung sobrang konti na ng mga taong kaya magsulat in Spanish today. And of course, in their local language, Pampango or Kapampangan. So, for example, um, Lino G. Dizon's uh, Pasyon ding Talapagobra used a traditional pasyon, which is a Spanish influence, but also used the vernacular to discuss the injustices suffered by the working class farmers. So, it, the, 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 the context here was very much um, influenced by what was then Spanish way of living in the Philippines. But the delivery of the story was in Kapampangan. And it spoke of the other contexts that they have there, which are the injustices suffered by the working class farmers. From the Hacienderos, uh, most likely from the landowners, landlords. Okay? However, the initial flourishing of Kapampangan literature in the early 20th century would fade, as publications dedicated to this literature never seemed to take hold so medyo nawal, hindi na kailangan ng steady um, venue for writing or steady space or a stable space where people can actually write and promote their writing and showcase their writing. So kagaya ng sa Ilocano writing, ano, meron silang El Ilocano during the time of the Spaniards. And then later on in the modern time, until today, they have the Banawag. So sa... Kapampangan, they never really had that. So that was that was um a missed opportunity for them to promote their local literature and to encourage young writers, young and upcoming writers, to write more and to not be afraid of showing their works kasi wala masyadong outlet for them to write more. Pero ngayon parang hindi na to problema, no? Kasi we have the vlogs, we have Facebook, we have social media, we have streaming sites, and everybody can basically put out a content out there and it's just up to people if they would like it or not if they would be drawn to it uh drawn to it or if they would you know find it interesting and if they would have an appreciation for it okay philippine literature from the regions expressed pessimism that the region would be able to produce new work uh, unless it sees new writers step in with a clear notion of their own regionality and are able to speak with clear voices to contribute to the country. So, ito yun yung problema, no? Medyo, 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 um, medyo hindi ganun ka-optimistic or positive ang, 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 tawag dito, um, it's not really mindset, yung prediction ng, ng community of writers when it comes to regional writing, kasi parang, 
unless talagang may isang unless talagang magiging klaro ka on on what your identity is as part of that region at klaro ka din sa ano bang mensahe ang gusto mong iparating na representative or na, na nag-represent sa inyo bilang bahagi ng region na yan. No? And if if we could find, according to this um, expression by Lourdes Vidal, if we can find, you know, the perfect balance of, you know, finding someone who can eloquently deliver a message using the languages of that region and being very aware of your identity being a part of that region, then that could contribute to the growth of the country's literature. Okay? So, this is the context from which John Jack Wigley, the author of um, the Home of the Ashfall literary essay, is writing about a context of regional literature that is seen to be struggling and is in need of new writing to revitalize it. So, para sa akin, no, na reintroduce ni John Jack Wigley yung yung tao yung mga yung audience yung Filipino audience to a specific regional literature which is kapampangan na it exists na work as much capable as other regional literature na we're as much interesting we're as much entertaining as other uh, literary works that were produced in other regions no? na kayang i-revitalize, na kayang magkaroon ng interes ng, ng Pilipino bilang isang ka, i, i, sa kabuuan, no? regardless kung saan galing yung regional literary piece na yon. So I think that's what was achieved by uh, Mr. John Jack Wigley in his writing of Home of the Essay. Now, a few more things, no? I just wanna... Um, define style and tone because this was used quite extensively and very smartly very intelligently in the in the writing of home of the ashfall so style by definition already contains uniqueness you know a part of its nature since style can mean a unique way of of expressing oneself ito yung ano eh yung parang signature mo as a writer kubaga parang ako for example if i'm a writer at nabasa niyo yung mga sulatin ko, you can, you can have a distinguishable style na ako yun. Parang pag binasa niyo yung isang linya, ah, gawang Sir De La Rosa yan, or gawang uh, Sir John Jack Wigley yan. Ramdam niyo agad na siya yung nagsulat. Kasi meron siyang particular uniqueness or that he imprints or that the writer imprints on the, the way he writes um uh, a literary piece or ang isang piyasa. So, thus, an essay written in a particular style would make the essay different from the others. No? Kaya yung, yung, yung pag-develop mo ng style mo, it's a way for you to stand out, you know, amongst the rest. No? Napakaraming writers, no? there are millions of writers in the world, and how do you stand out? How do you get known? That's the style. No, you have your own style. But on the singing, no, like we have the likes of Billie Eilish, who has a very particular style of singing, like babyish, lullabyish sort of singing or toddler sort of singing. Uh, we have Alesha Cara, no, with her grit, with her growls and the rasp in her voice, the rawness of her voice. We have Christina Aguilera. You know, when you hear her voice, it's very identifiable. Na, oh, that's a Christina voice. So, yun yung style, no? Uh, what sets you apart from other writers, you know? What makes you unique uh, from the others? And what makes you you as a writer? So, that's the style. Okay. So, again, importante yun kasi, you know, you'll just end up drowning in a sea of writers if you wo- if you don't know how to develop your own style. And if you won't be able to um, uh, hone further what your own style is, yeah? so kailangan talaga meron kang originality as a writer also. Okay. How about tone? So tone or the attitude being conveyed by the language used by the writer, it's also essential in, in you know, sort of creating a distinctive style. No? So, yung tone mo, basically, yun yung attitude mo 
na gustong iparamdam sa audience mo eh. Like, are you being sarcastic? No? Are you being feisty when you write? Are you being solemn? Are you being sober? Are you being um uh, frank? Straightforward? Are you being brutal? You know? Are you being um in, yeah, as I've said, brutal or frank? Um, are you being um, evasive? Are you being circular? Yung parang ayaw magpaka-direct to the point? Are you being verbose? You know, are you being superfluous? Are you being pretentious? You know, so all of those are attitudes that your write, your readers or your audience can actually feel in the tone of how you write your stuff, your your piece, no? So, lahat yan, mararamdaman niya ng, um, ng, yung attitude mo sa pagkusulat. That's gonna be felt by your, um, what's this? Um, readers, by your audience. And again, tone is, tone plus style makes you a distinct writer, sets you apart as a writer. So, tone in writing is also very important in helping the writer convey meaning to the reader. Siyempre, for example, yung isang eksena ng story, nagkaka- may confrontation sila doon. So, hindi pwedeng mabait yung, yung, yung mararamdaman ng reader mo. Tapos, confrontation pala yung nagaganap. You have to match the angst of your choice of words, your selection of words, your diction. You have to match the aggression in your choice of words to the confrontation you know, to the to the aggressive confrontation that's happening in that particular scene or situation of your storytelling so dapat ganon okay so i-match mo siya at iparamdam mo na may intensity may may certain level of emotional intensity na nagaganap doon sa isang uh, parte ng sinusulat mo because that's what's required by that particular part okay and in in a way no kapag magaling kang gumamit ng tone at very flexible very versatile ka magiba-iba ng tone that also can give away something to your readers it could tell na you are a writer who think thoughtfully about what you write about no so tone carries carries more than just feelings but also it can direct a reader to a meaning, to the meanings you want to deliver, to the messages you want to deliver in your, um, in your, what's this? Uh, in your write-up, in your piece, in your storytelling, or whatever form of literary piece you're writing about. Okay? So that's it. That ends our discussion for Lesson 6. Uh, introduction to the Literary Contributions of Central Luzon, specifically Pampanga. Thank you.